Excellence. Mesdames et messieurs, je m'appelle... Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Anya Schur, I'm the president of the CERT, the Association for the Promotion of Francopho Francophonie and Multilingualism. We're based in Vienna. I'm very pleased to be with you today for this French-held discussion in the Hofburg Palace, which is a historic venue for diplomacy. As you're definitely aware, following the Congress of Vienna, which was held in this very spot, in 1994-1995, the final act was drafted in French. This was a la language which at the time started replacing Latin as the language of diplomacy. Today, English plays this role. It is the official language of 67 countries used by default, which gives it a monopoly in many areas such as trade, research, and diplomacy. The influence of an English-speaking culture can be seen in media, music, and literature inter alia. This has led to English's popularity across the globe. However, there are increasing voices calling for the use of French in international discussions. The French-speaking community is an important one. It brings together 29 countries with French as the official or co-official language. I would add seven others to those where French is spoken daily by more than 20% of the population. Numerous diplomats, in particular Austrians, speak French perfectly. So what does using French bring to international discussions? So as to debate this, we have brought together four ambassadors from Vienna or Geneva who will be talking about their experience regarding French and its role in multilingualism in international discussions. I'd like to present our panelists. First, Owe Monceau. He's the permanent representative of the International Organization of Francophonie to the United Nations Office and other international organizations in Geneva since 2003, as well as from 2017 to 2020. In the interim, he ha also served as director of economic and digital francophonie of the organization, OIF. There, he also has worked as programmatic and scientific coordinator of the Second World Forum on French Language. He is also a member of the pilot committee of the Francophone Innovation Network. He holds several master's degrees from the Universal, uh, University of Paris 1, Sorbonne, and CNAM, as well as a master's in economics and management. And also, if I'm not mistaken, you studied medieval history at the Catholic, uh, Catholic University of Louvain. Then, Madame Caroline Vermelin. Since 2002, she has been the Permanent representative of the Kingdom of Belgium. She's also served in Slovenia and Bosnia Herzegovina. She, as I said, is permanent representative of Belgium to UNOV. She is part of the diplomatic services of the foreign ministry since 2017 in Belgium. She was in Beijing, Taipei, Moscow, Tokyo, and Brussels. She has a master's in contemporary history from the same Catholic University of Louvain, as well as the European College. So you, you crossed paths, but of course not studying the same type of history. She speaks Dutch, French, German, English, and Italian. English, as I said, yes, it's hard to keep track. Now, Mr. Albert Dolé, he is the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Côte d'Ivoire to the Vienna-based organizations since September 2021. He's a career diplomat. In 2004, he became part of the foreign ministry of his country, where he held several high-ranking posts, including the Deputy Secretary General of State, the foreign minister, as well as director of strategy. He served in Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, and Sudan. Of course, I can't go through his full resume, but he holds a master's in private law 
from the University of Abidjan, as well as an international diploma from San Remo, and a, cert a, a diploma from the Korean Research Institute. Finally, I'd like to present Her Excellency, Ms. Delphine Honora Poiza, since 2002 has been the permanent representative of France to Vienna-based organizations. For, before this, she was Director of Strategic Affairs, S Security and Disarmament of the French Ministry of European Affairs. She w was posted in London as well as Paris and has studied s political sciences in Paris and Berlin. She speaks Czech, Chinese, German, English, and French. To, to start our discussions, I would like to talk, talk about uh, francophony practices in international organizations. I'm going to ask our representative from Belgium first. And of course, I mean you, madam, such that she perhaps paints a picture of the linguistic practices here in Vienna, and in particular in the VIC amongst diplomats. While we know that English is prevalent, are there other specific cases? Are there other international organizations where more languages are sp spoken? Good afternoon. Thank you very much to the organizers for having invited me to this panel. When it comes to your first question, as you know officially at the United Nations, interpretation is offered in six official languages. That is English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. It, the, these services allow for precise and clear communication among stakeholders on major issues. Many times this can be a vector of equality, linguistic equality. In CTBTO, multilingualism is in the forefront. But given the size of the organization, it's not a large organization, it's rather difficult to ensure that there is translation of all documents, including very technical ones, in all languages at all times. Let us not forget also that interpretation and translation come at a cost. So it's important to pr promote multilingualism in international organizations. However, this does have consequences, usually financial ones, budget impacts, as well as in terms of human resources. I talked about the six official languages. That's good. But what also means is that many delegations are not negotiating in their native language. This is a true challenge when it comes to being clear, sharing thoughts, subtleties, and ensuring the debates are effective, but also in terms of understanding. It is an issue which is particularly important that in the more informal meetings, usually as or often, as you said, we see a monopoly of English. In these cases, English is being used as the lingua franca or the common language for many delegations. But it also means that English is impacted by mm, lack of knowledge in technical domains for those speaking it. This is a situation where there is just one language being used, and sometimes it means that negotiations aren't as inclusive as they could be. Sometimes it's difficult to have experts from capital with sufficient level of English such that they can negotiate successfully or even uh, take action internationally. On the other hand, multilingualism allows for genuine dialogue. It provides access to information and gives a way to participate in this common vision, what we're attempting to build in international organizations. So greater equality with more languages. This is very important. It is a crucial element of the United Nations which draws strength from its diversity. I'd like to highlight a particular feature of Vienna, but not just Vienna, that is the group of French-speaking ambassadors, or the GAF. Usually, in international organizations, there are regional groups, or those who are brought together by values or common interest. It's not very often that there are groups linguistic groups, but indeed the GAF 
is a group that is brought together. Uh, there are countries that are extremely different from very different regions, not necessarily sharing the same values, but who all share French for discussion and exchanges, which in turn contributes to better understanding of positions. I think this is a very positive example of how French and multilingualism can be promoted in international organizations. Thank you. Thank you. So you talked about GAF. And the OIF, for more than 15 years, has been supporting French in international organizations through GAF, but also through strengthening capaci uh, capacity for French-speaking diplomats in international organizations. The OIF is also building capacity in translation and services. It has established a alert and action-taking mechanism for French in international organizations. You talked about the GAF. I'm wondering if our other panelists, Mr. Monsoc, might also tell us more about the how this group works. And it's not just in Vienna. Yes, yes, definitely. Just a parenthesis first, though. I'd like to extend a very heartfelt thanks for the to the CTPTO, not just for inviting me, but also for having organized the panels in the particular order that they did. How do you organize such an important conference with certain cross-cutting issues, including the matter of multilingualism? I think that this is crucial when it comes to the very meaning of multilingualism. So I'd like to thank Executive Secretary Floyd for having organized our conference in this manner. So just a little bit of background on Francophonie and the OIF. The OIF is an African organization because it was established by three African heads of state. Deposero Sangar, Senegal, Abi Bogiba, Tunisia, and Amir Diori from Niger. These three heads of state had the common feature of being the first head of state of their country to have recently acceded to independence. And the goal when they created in 1970 the OIF was to ensure that there would be a multilateral platform for them to use, a place where they could be a part of the rapidly developing multilateral system. It's very important to remember that this is an African organization, number one, and not as we think of certain other similar organizations bringing together Spanish language speaking countries or Portuguese speaking countries. If you, if you like, this is sort of the opposite type of situation where you have formal colonies interacting with those who colonized them and coming together in a community of 54 states and government, plenty potentiary members, with additional observer states. So the whole point, because you were asking about the groups, the GAF, I think this is more like an inter group, if you like. The ambassador talked about multilateralism usually being based on regional groups. Francophonie, and not just, is a way of going beyond geographical or political lines. It is more about dialogue, bringing together peoples from five continents in the case of French-speaking ones. So that's really the idea to such an extent that GAF came actually before the OIF, because the first group of French ambassadors appeared in 1965, so five years between uh, before the creation of the OIF, and I think 12 years before the next large French-speaking organization, which would be the organiza organization of uh, French-speaking parliaments. So this is a platform for dialogue. 
uh, and f in a non-legally binding context, there, in the sense that there are no rules, um, no sort of regulations. It's a very simple format for discussion and creating consensus, enough consensus, sometimes that then leads to solutions, solutions that are applied in the future. I will give you an example of a stalemate and then an example of a solution used in the future. The first one happened in Geneva, a stalemate. You might know about the nuclear ban treaty. So, in Geneva, in Geneva, I was mentioning, mentioning a stalemate that occurred in the ILO on, the, on certain concepts and basic ideas even, and the ambassador of Morocco was the coordinator in the, the French thematic group regarding employment and health. Well, he was tasked by the African group as well as by the Organization of Islamic Co Cooperation and the OIF to be the mediator. A solution was found, and you'll have seen in the press that at the end of the day, there was a positive outcome and the budget was salvaged. So this is the mediation example. And then on the future, what about the work done here? Well, it's very important. because international and multilateral policy has its center of gravity somewhere between cultural discussion and those on, uh, discussions on technology. You know that the global digital impact is being currently discussed in New York. It's going to be the first global document at the level of the international community, one which will provide a shared concept of digital development. La francophonie est à l'œuvre. And here too, francophonie is right in time alongside our other colleagues. And I'll end by saying that I was referring to francophonie, and perhaps that's a certain ease afforded to be by my language, because indeed francophonie is also a synonym, if you like, of multilingualism. We, as the International Organization of Francophonie, work in French as well as in the local languages of our countries, because ultimately, all of the French-speaking countries have more than one single language, and it's very important to ensure, as was said earlier, Madam, in your preamble, that the people are brought as close as possible to these international uh, and multilateral political debates, and that this be made uh, comprehensible using the languages available to people. That lies at the very heart of our approach and indeed of our political working methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So indeed, as you said, the OIF is an African organization. Now I will turn to address the representative of Cote d'Ivoire. The African continent, similar to the European Union, from the outside, appears to represent a solid block here at the Vienna International Center and also in light of other international organizations and in the landmark resolutions adopted. So we're asking, what is the exact situation in French-speaking Africa and the African continent overall? Is there a sense of identity within the group? Could you perhaps describe to us the dynamic within the African group? Thank you very much. Like my colleagues, I also would like to thank CTPTO for organizing this event and also for in allowing Cote d'Ivoire to participate in this important encounter. Now, let me answer your question. In terms of negotiations regarding elections, as our colleague pointed out previously, this is on the basis of geographic distribution. So, on the African continent, no distinction is made between either English-speaking or French-speaking groups for two reasons. Firstly, 
because there's more than just two linguistic communities. We have the Portuguese-speaking community, the Arabic-speaking community, many other linguistic communities on the African continent. Second reason, in all of the capital cities, there is an African group. And this group is responsible for contacting the state's parties, working together with them in order to adopt a common position as regards the major international questions at hand. And these negotiations then are based on consultation and coordination. And when documents are adopted, it is the chair of the African group in each capital who then speaks on behalf of the African group. So once again, we don't make any distinction based on a language distinction. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. That was very clear. Now let me turn to France for a specific question as regards CTBTO. Working Group B of the Preparatory Commission has urged the organization to engage in multilingual training in order to help build capacity regarding the use of national data centers. For its part, the Provisional Technical Secretary at the PTS has highlighted the need to also implement regional events to that end. This in turn has led the CTBTO in 2019 for the very first time for French-speaking NDCs in Madagascar to organize a workshop. And in order to continue these efforts, a second French-speaking regional training course was organized in Niamey in March 2023. Now, 33 experts from, Fran from 15 French-speaking countries highlighted the benefits of these training courses, facilitating exchanges, allowing them to strengthen their understanding of technical aspects that were presented to them by the PTS experts. Now, as you see it, regarding the use of the French language and more generally speaking, multilingualism in order to help strengthen the technical capacity of signatory states of CTPTO, do you see this as an essential tool to support multilateralism? Thank you very much and hello everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to take the floor and to address you here today. And indeed, I'm most honored to be able to do so to address such an illustrious audience as today. Now, you were asking me, why are we seeking to promote multilingualism? Let me give two answers. Based on history and experience, more, than, uh, more experience than I may have, and I think it's an important point to recall today, because as you indicated earlier, and as my colleague, the Ambassador of Belgium, also echoed, multilateralism at times is often seen as or presented as being uh, something that comes at a cost for its member states and organizations. But what I want to say to you is this, multilateralism, since the establishment of the United Nations and indeed the inception of international, the international community, even if it is not necessarily reflected as such within the Charter, was always a deliberate choice that was made. Why deliberate choice? Because it enshrined ambitions, and I think that's worth recalling today. It enshrined an ambition, namely, the hope of achieving universalization. And this is equally important in light of CTBTO because the CTBT itself helps to cherish that ambition of reaching universalization. And this is a, an opportunity to welcome and commend the efforts undertaken by the Executive Secretary who is joining us this afternoon and who is indeed seeking to achieve the universalization of the treaty. The General Assembly of the United Nations had also made clear that link that we must never forget between universalization, universality, and u multilingualism by enshrining in one of its very first resolution, I think even perhaps the second resolution, which to a certain extent reflects the importance of this aspect, that all states have the right and the duty to make themselves understood and to understand others. Multilingualism clearly is an incontrovertible means in order to reach that aim. Ultimately, the General Assembly then, on numerous occasions, indicated that the use of several languages or more languages should not be seen as a barrier, but rather as a means to reach the objective set forth in the Charter of the United Nations. As such, this is a message worth recalling. Multilingualism truly is a corollary of multilateralism, or perhaps to use simpler terms, I would say that multilingualism really goes hand in hand with multilateral diplomacy. 
it's a powerful and effective tool in order to ensure greater international cooperation in the context of the technical cooperation that we were talking about earlier. And it's a reality, it's a fact that international organizations and the CTBTO also see on a day-to-day -day basis, in particular when it comes to implementing technical cooperation programs and projects. Some regional or inter-regional organizations only work in French, or mostly in French. And so if the CTBTO really wants to ensure its cooperation is as effective as possible, which is what we all aspire to, and working together with these organizations, it needs to be able to mobilize both resources and French-speaking staff. And it is based on that certainty that underscores the important role of multilingualism in order to ensure greater international cooperation. And this was also made clear at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And it is, again, our shared legacy in a resolution that enshrines multilingualism as one of the fundamental values of the United Nations organization. And I know that some of you like I, have a very clear preference for resolutions and their texts. I'll read it out to you, and please bear with me, if you wouldn't mind. Let me read out to you a few passages of that key resolution, which I believe remain fully relevant, fully topical, in order to answer that question as to why today, here in the CTBT and in all international organizations, why should we continue to promote multilingualism in our work and in our discussions? Now, so here's what the resolution has to say. It says, considering that multilingualism is a fundamental value of the United Nations organization in order to achieve the aims and purposes of the charter, that is peace and international security, achieving friendly relations among nations, ensuring international cooperation, and then aware that multilingualism is a driver of multilateral diplomacy and contributes to promoting the values of the organization, which are equally the values of francophonie, ultimately. Mindful that multilingualism is a means to promote, to protect, and to preserve linguistic diversity and the diversity of cultures worldwide, as well as enhancing the efficiency, effectiveness of results and the transparency of its activities. And then finally, Mindful that multilingualism promotes, and this is also something that is very important for all of us here, promotes unity in diversity and ensuring that understanding, dialogue and comprehension prevail. In light of this acknowledgement of the role of multilingualism as a means in international negotiations and discussions to help promote cooperation projects and programs, understanding, tolerance, dialogue, and this acknowledgement of multilingualism as a means to increase transparency, efficacy. I would also add the following, because I believe this also lies at the heart of multilateralism and lies at the heart of the work of organizations such as the CTBTO and of Francophonie. I would add the following two ideas, namely equality among states and inclusiveness in debates and in our work multilingualism, the use of French, but the use of all of the other languages, the official languages of the CTBTO or of other international organizations, is essentially a factor supporting equality among stakeholders, allowing them to engage in negotiations and discussions. As part of this effort to promote multilingualism, French, well, clearly, and I'm, not, I'm certain you're not surprised to hear me say this, French naturally has an important role to play given that this is the fifth language most widely spoken in the world, spoken by more than 320 million people, and it is equally a language that is constantly expanding. And I'm sure you won't contradict me on that point. Now, before I finish, and answering your question somewhat more directly, allow me to perhaps flag a risk that is intrinsically linked to a monolingual language environment, which is a growing trend in certain fora and perhaps in some international organizations, a risk that is all the more significant, I believe, in scientific and technical fora, such as within the CTBTO compared to others. Indeed, technical experts, and my Belgian colleague already 
noted this, are technical experts who often participate actively in debates and who bring their skill and competencies to these discussions and to the decisions being adopted there may not always have the necessary mastery of these languages. Let's not forget that their university background, after all, the courses that they have followed in most cases frequently were in the languages taught in their countries of origin or perhaps in other languages of the United Nations, not necessarily in English. And it is those other languages that they use daily in their work in their laboratories where they are best able to express themselves and best able to convey their technical ideas and analysis. Against that backdrop, again, not being able to draw on multilingualism means we run the risk of drastically curbing the ability of these experts to understand these debates, but above all to participate actively and in so doing making significant contributions. So I will leave it at that. Again, reinforcing multilingualism and multilateralism, again, that is our goal here, one that we must all continue to support. And I'm delighted, delighted to see this panel taking place, demonstrating the commitment of the authorities of this organization to this priority, the shared priority of ours, to strengthen multilateralism with the understanding that in order to do so, we must continue to promote multilingualism. Thank you very much. Thank you. You were underscoring the values of universality through multilingualism as well as equality and inclusiveness. And I believe that brings me now to Ambassador Monceau. I think that these are values that lie very close to your heart. Well, yes, indeed. I was very pleased to uh, hear such a clear and well-detailed presentation. But yes, the multilateral system as it currently works faces two challenges. Let us recall that for the most part, its architecture dates back to the global area, the global pre-digital area at a time when the fundaments, the principles of the UN system were being established, but which are quite different from the situation that we are currently in. Also in terms of the pace of innovation, which has equally had an impact as a result of the digital revolution moving from a rather linear type of progression to a speed of accumulation, as we can see on nearly a daily basis, to a form of reasoning which is far more uh, spontaneous, instantaneous, changing the relationship between time and space. I would say undoubtedly that the balance between the political debate lies somewhere between the cultural and technological stakes, for the most part these days. If we take stock of immense challenges that we face in terms of peace and security, human rights, development, well, there you will see that that matrix indeed does apply. And it would be difficult to imagine things differently were we not to have that strong desire for inclusiveness, which requires a better understanding of the issues of multilingualism and not seeing language merely as something that is purely functional, but rather as a vehicle for culture. What conveys what circulates in a language is not only something that is instantaneous, rather it is a backdrop of historical development, a wealth of development. And at times, the only way that we are able to reach someone intellectually. So indeed, this is something that we need to take into account, we need to prepare for, perhaps more than we are so doing. It is something that uh, many international organizations have started to look at more closely than they have in recent years. There may be some excuses, budgetary constraints, for instance. Insufficient budgetary resources are provided to that end. But yes, indeed, the issue of multilingualism, interpretation, translation, These should not be seen as a budgetary adjustment factor. 
And I'm sure that I'm not the only one here who at times has sat through debates in the Fifth Committee in New York where indeed all too often it is unfortunately the case that that's what happens without considering the implications. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence in all areas. Well, artificial intelligence is less new than you may think it is, but a good share of artificial generative intelligence is indeed based on existing documentation that is available, often free of charge, that's interesting to note, for the companies developing it, such as, for instance, the documents being produced by the United Nations. And again, the fact that there is a lack of linguistic diversity has an impact, an impoverishment of thought, of language, and will in turn have a knock-on effect on the artificial intelligence that is thus generated. And this will continue to play an increasing role in all of our lives. So let's be aware of that as a possible stake as well, and let's ensure that we are able to meet those challenges. Let us be able to think ahead because the, therein lies the survival, therein lies the survival, I would say, even above and beyond the multilateral system of ensuring that we have a balance on this planet, even if there is a great deal of room for improvement. But let's make sure that we are able to do this, bearing these fundamental stakes in mind, and proving that we are able to think beyond the short term. Thank you very much. Before I put a question to the Ambassador of Belgium, I'd like to uh, remind you that there is a question and answer session, and if you have questions, you can also use the app. I think everybody here has downloaded the app. So you can submit your questions, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the session. Belgium. Belgium is a French-speaking country, but also Dutch-speaking, and to a certain extent, German-speaking. Your diplomats are multilingual, and in your um, embassies, the three languages are spoken on a daily basis. Now, this multilingualism, which starts off in primary schools in Belgium, and which is part of your diplomatic training, to what extent can this be seen as an asset in the, discus in the discussions within which Belgium takes part? Well, thank you very much for that question. Indeed, given its nature, Belgium is able to make a significant contribution to this discussion. And my colleague and my compatriot, Ambassador Monceau, has already started to answer that question. pointing out that language is more than just a set of grammatical examples. It's has, it ties in with our cultures, our identities. There are more than 11 million Belgians. But I'm certain we're all very, very different. There's no one single identity. And our Belgian identity is shifting and changes based on the mother tongue that we will have learned, and this is without embarking on a lengthy lecture of our of Belgian constitutional law. I just recall that indeed our country comprises three different linguistic community, Dutch speaking, French speaking, and German speaking. And these communities determine the use of languages in the education, in administration, and in their relations, their trading relations, etc for these separate regions, Flanders, Wallonia, and Brussels. So principally, each region is monolingual, with the exception of Brussels, which has a particular status, because it is bilingual. And so multilingualism is very much part of our everyday lives in Belgium. It's equally visible within the federal government, where there is linguistic parity, meaning the same number of French-speaking ministers as Dutch-speaking ministers. And beyond all of that, we also have the Prime Minister, who, for the duration of his or her term, regardless of the uh, mother tongue, is uh, expected to be a, a polyglot, a multilingual polyglot. And this multilingualism, bilingualism, trilingualism, is something that we practice also in our federal administration with at least passive bilingualism, meaning that you have the right to speak your own language and the other is supposed to be able to understand that language. In terms of Belgian diplomacy, we are at a minimum trilingual, English, French and Dutch, and here too, parity among the diplomats, same number of diplomats who are Dutch speaking as well as 
uh, coming from the Dutch-speaking community and French-speaking diplomats, so parity in numbers. And that linguistic openness, of course, facilitates communication. It makes it easier to understand one another, to appreciate the richness of other languages, of other ways of thinking, and that enables Belgian diplomats, whether it's within Belgium or outside, to engage in closer contacts and also to uh, go about their activities with greater confidence and to be able to convey their messages and to contribute towards consensus finding. Regarding the education system, after children start learning their second language at a very early stage, but in some regions such as Wallonia, the choice of language is left up to that pupil. And if a pupil decides not to choose the second national language, they have the freedom to choose English. And it has been noted that one out of three school children chooses Dutch, whereas it was one out of two just eight years ago. So yes, there is a decrease, unfortunately, when it comes to learning the other national language. That is therefore something that we are looking at in Belgium, even given the omnipresence of bilingualism in our country, it's something that we too have to keep working on. We ha still have to make efforts in order to keep multilingualism alive and to keep that interest and awareness of the other alive, above all, through language. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to give the floor to uh, another large multilingual country, Côte d'Ivoire. French is the official language of Côte d'Ivoire, but it has never replaced African languages. There are some 60 languages in Côte d'Ivoire. Ivorian languages have also influenced French to the extent that, uh, let me show you this video of Nushi, a very popular uh, French speaker. I imagine that you can speak and understand several of these languages. Are diplomats of the African continent aware that their multilingualism is an asset and that they are able to um, benefit from this linguistic wealth? I imagine that often you are, have to deal with um, English-speaking diplomats who only speak one language, whereas you speak many. Thank you very much. Cote d'Ivoire, indeed, is one of the founding members of Francophonie, contributing thus to strengthening multilingualism, as was so well underscored. And the importance of French in Côte d'Ivoire does not have an effect on the local languages, which in turn have an effect, have an influence on French. Côte d'Ivoire, therefore, there is a people's language, a mix of a French and local African languages spoken. This is Nushi, which is a proof of effective communication. It's the tool used by young people, some 60% of our population. So yes, at this stage, Nushi isn't yet a fully-fledged uh, language in the group, but it is one of the key languages used for common communication. How did Nushi develop? Well, as I was saying, we are surrounded by countries with uh, linguistic diversities. There are some 60 ethnic groups. And the, when the government had to choose official languages, alongside French, the peoples of the different communities needed to be able to communicate with one another. That was the first thing to bear in mind. And secondly, when we travel abroad, well, unlike in some countries where you have local languages which are also the national languages, if two Ivorians meet here, well, we will probably have to speak French to one another. So, Nushi has really become very popular to the extent that French dictionaries have even, in fact, included several Nushi words in La Rousse, in French La Rousse. Boucantier, which is a word which means somebody who enjoys luxury. Uh, there is a word uh, go, which has been added to the French dictionary. It's a term used for women. There are many other words now which have been added as a result. And that means that Cote d'Ivoire is also contributing to this 
growing multilingualism. Now, the second aspect of your question, you were asking about the assets of multilingualism. And I believe after that very interesting presentation of my colleagues from France and Belgium and my colleagues, well, I think the assets, the advantages are very clear. There's two that I'd like to highlight in terms of social and professional inclusiveness. For us here who are diplomats, it's very important that whenever vacancy announcements are issued, it says quite clearly, well, if you don't speak English, you're disadvantaged from the outset. So multilingualism really is important. But another aspect to bear in mind has to do with certain developmental factors and the need for intercultural dialogue. We need to see this as a tool, an asset, something that helps open minds, that helps strengthen democratic values and tolerance. And for African diplomats, as we see it, we are very much aware of the advantages of multilingualism. And in particular in Cote d'Ivoire, we are aware of these values, as we can see reflected in our school systems. As of the, uh, you start off learning four languages, the early years in school, French and English, and then two other languages at choice, Arabic and German, are on offer. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Cote d'Ivoire is the country actually with the largest number of uh, German students, German-speaking teachers also. And unfortunately, this doesn't continue to university because after secondary school, once the students choose their uh, vocational choices, then unfortunately there's an interruption. We've decided also to prioritize local African languages, and there is an ongoing project to that end, based on an experimental phase, partial regionalization, and then a generalization stage. Right now we're at the early pilot phase, where we have some 10 local languages that are being taught in primary school and in preschool in 10 villages. And I think after that pilot stage, we'll move on to the next one, which is the partial regionalization phase. And then finally, generalization. So, to sum up, indeed, for diplomats, multilingualism really is an advantage. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. I have one last question. I think you've all already partially responded because I think there are perhaps things that need to be redefined. International organizations recognize the diversity of people and cultures, and thus the diversity of languages. We saw that upholding multilingualism is key for multilateralism, but also good governance, and I'm wondering if you could each share your view on this. France first, please. Thank you. As I had underscored, Basically, multilingualism improves efficiency and also ensures greater transparency. It makes the work of international organizations more accessible to some member states, but not just to member states. It also means that the work of international organizations and the outcomes and discussions are more accessible to everyday people and societies who I hope, and this, this is what I think all diplomats work for, uh, I hope that our work is of interest to our people, our taxpayers, who are contributing to the financing of these international organizations and to what they're doing. So all the better that this be done in various languages, making this work, in turn, the publications, the documents, more ac accessible to the broader public. Thank you. I would like to go now to the last section of the discussion. We've understood the advantages of multilingualism and the contribution of francophonie. So let's perhaps broaden our horizons. I'll go to the OIF first, I think. In the Jerba statement adopted last year by heads of state and government of French-speaking countries, 
you have the following sentence. In international or and regional organizations where the French language is an official and or working language, if this is our only official language, we in written and spoken communication will express ourselves in French. This is great to see on paper, but what will it look like as applied in international organizations? I think that collectively we have provided quite a bit of response to that question already. I'd actually like to go back maybe though to one aspect, namely that often the OIF and other types of organizations except for Commonwealth of course, of course are experience pressure because people say, what could you do more for the language? And I think that's going about it the wrong way around. I, that is because very often international organizations are counting on some organizations based on language. And it doesn't matter if it's French or Spanish or other languages. And they count on them for perhaps for additional support when it comes to translation, interpretation. But as, as I was attempting to explain earlier, that's not really the challenge. It's not just a it's not so much about ticking the box, ensuring that there's some sort of formal commitment commitment. No. It's more about understanding the extent to which it is key to have this type of openness and this type of exchange in an international system to ensure that discussions are as most genuine as possible. It's clear that more languages, much, many more languages, should be present in international discussions. And maybe that will be possible rather quickly thanks to technological pro progress, in particular in certain fora. But a s attitude of openness is necessary, as is political will. Within the organizations themselves. It's important that each individual understand this. In Gerba, the heads of state and government in adopting the, the declaration were attempting to express the idea. I mean, sometimes it's, sometimes diplomats themselves come under pressure and find themselves in awkward positions in monolingual contexts. or in with a limited number of languages and of course they could ha this could happen to heads of state heads of state themselves too and this is all very complicated in a changing world but let's remain mindful of the fact that without diversity the collective world we are building will be will be much more at risk and will be lacking much more. So there's a direct connection between multilingualism, innovation, and technology, the main topics of this conference, and then the ultimate goal of the maintenance of international peace and security globally. Thank you. I'd like to go back to France. As we seek specific solutions during France's presidency of the EU in 2022, France asked Professor Christian Lequen to draw up a report on linguistic diversity in European institutions. We heard the conclusions last week. I think some of you were present. He said that the goal of the report was not seeking to replace English monopoly with the French one. This was about promoting li multilingualism because defending French also means defending linguistic diversity. The Power Can report 
presents a series of recommendations for European institutions, but also some which could have applications in international organizations as well. I'm wondering if France, because you're holding this, uh, the, you, the Secretariat of GAF currently, we're wondering what could contribute to greater multilingualism in international organizations and French being more widely used. Thank you. Thank you for having mentioned the report. This was a centerpiece of the discussions held under the French presidency of the European Union. As you said, the report contains 26 recommendations. They were very interesting and provided food for thought. As I've already quoted certain paragraphs from a resolution, you might be worried that I'm going to now read out the 26 re recommendations, but I'm definitely not going to do that. I'll just pick a few. The first recommendation that we think is a good starting point is, uh, with respect to what is done in the UN, is about incurring, encouraging the issuance of a yearly report on multilingualism for an assessment of multilingualism in practice in international organizations, and in particular in the CTBTO. There was another proposal made which is well known, but which is nonetheless very relevant, that is asking for systematic use of uh, interpretation in working groups. So not just in plenaries, but interpretation for working groups as well. Uh, for all formal sessions in the CTBTO, in the prep common subsidiary bodies, this is actually what is done. Progress has been made because now, the sessions of expert groups of WGB are also interpreted. And then it would be possible to look at the request uh, the, uh, on the secure website of the CTBTO videos, and you have those in all six languages. Those are examples of actual progress, which should be welcomed. So the use of interpretation is definitely subject to a certain amount of disagreement because it does have cost implications for the budgets of the relevant organizations. But I hope that with my appeal you heard earlier, you're very convinced of the need to allocate those funds to promote multilingualism. There is something else that could be explored that would be simply beginning to write source documents in other in languages other than English again. So limiting the drafting of documents being published in just one language, usually that would be English, to 50% of total documents produced. I'm sure you're very aware of this next challenge. It's part of the linguistic practices of staff of the organization in particular uh, in particular, managerial staff. Usually, this type of staff is using English. It's a social practice because studies show that in reality, and we think this is promising, gives rise to hope, that they definitely haven't s forgotten all of those other languages that they that they speak, and definitely those include other languages other than English. So this is simply a matter of encouraging the practice of foreign languages other than English. What could also happen would be that there would be a statutory obligation to prove certain linguistic skills when applying for a promotion. Uh, but probably this won't happen for some time. And then in recruitment processes. Currently, all that's required is English, so as to be hired in certain organizations, I think including CTBTO. So perhaps a linguistic testing in two languages. That might help. And then finally, a third idea to promote multilingualism in 
the CTBTO inter alia. That would be to ensure that users can surf the website in many languages, because at this stage, and I think the ambassador said this already, technological innovation and AI translation can help us in promoting multilingualism in official communications. Clearly, there would have to be many legal protection clauses and huge investment in translation software, and not just, but I think that this is a promising means as well. Thank you. I will now give the floor to Côte d'Ivoire, because as we saw, the OIF originated in Africa, but, ling but the future of Francophonie does too. The French-speaking population in Africa is rapidly growing while it is diminishing in Africa. So what I'm wondering is if you think speaking French can be an advantage in international discussions when it comes to ensuring progress for French being spoken in general. Um, thank you. Well, I think that we could add that Africa is also the cradle, but also the future of French being spoken. So there's economic data as well. For quite some time, Africa was being presented as a poor continent, but it is clear to everyone today that dynamism is growing in Africa, emerging economies. You can see this with all leading countries signing cooperation agreements with Africa, France, Africa, China, Africa, etc. So beyond demographic data, there are also economic data, which do lead to, to believe that the future of French is in Africa. Then you have the number of those learning French in Africa. Today, there are an increasing number of people learning French in Africa, in French-speaking African countries, but also in English-speaking ones. Take Ghana, for an example. Zimbabwe, South Africa. The number of students in French, uh, in French, uh, institutions is growing. Beyond this, I would say that this is not just um, a given. French must continue to be promoted because there are other languages looming on the horizon, as you know. There's the monopoly of English. We talked about that earlier. But also certain stereotypes that continue today. Today, you have a huge population of youth in Africa. French is seen as a colonial language for some, one which alienates people, or even the language of the elite. So I think that means that there has to be some outreach so as to counter these stereotypes. In this context, for an African diplomat or one from Cote d'Ivoire, French is an advantage. You gave some data earlier. The French-speaking world is 16% of global GDP. Francophonie or French language is the sixth broadest spoken language and the third in terms of the business world. So in, in on the African continent, we have n about 98 countries affiliated and that means that uh, it is definitely an advantage for African, African diplomats, those of my country in particular. They can promote their countries through using French as well as business opportunities for African businesses. So I think if you look at it that way, speaking French is an advantage. Finally, It would be important when it comes to alliances of French speakers and positions taken regarding challenges that there be more consistency. As I said, African youth today 
are much more swayed by some certain positions taken by French speakers in Africa, the democratic values that are promoted in Francophonie organizations, the rule of law, upholding human rights. All of these are things that need to be emphasized so as to ensure that African youth have confidence in Francophonie organizations to see that they are key stakeholders politically, nationally. Thank you. Thank you. I have a last question for Belgium, and then we'll go to the audience. You talked about multilateralism facing multiple crises, including the war in Ukraine, but also partial implementation of the Paris Agreement, U.S. withdrawal from certain from some treaties. The ambassador said earlier that speaking French can provide solutions in difficult negotiations. Do you think that you might have other examples of situations where francophonie or multilingualism can provide solutions? Yes, well, I think that my colleagues have shared several examples. They've describe certain advantages of multilingualism and speaking French, and I'd like to emphasize two which were just shared from my colleague from Côte d'Ivoire. I mean, basically not taking anything for granted, not resting on our laurels, focusing on youth and other communities regarding the importance of French, and more simply put, the importance of speaking other languages as vehicles of other cultures and means of communication. And then I touch upon what my French colleague said. I'm looking in the room, and of course the spotlights mean that I can't see everything, but I don't see a lot of people wearing uh, earpieces. And what that means is we're preaching to the choir. I think that the French ambassador said that multilingualism needs to be promoted to those who think that they least need it, and that means English native speakers. I think that's very important. So independently of the second language learned, be it French, Arabic, or Chinese, whatever that language may be, it's extremely important to ensure communication can happen. Then coming back to your question about multilingualism and Francophonie when it comes to various crises. Well, as was already said, I think when it comes to facilitating negotiations and mediation, it's extremely important. It ensures mutual understanding, seeking shared solutions. It has an important role to play in those exchanges. French and multilingualism could mean promoting inclusive dialogue. Yes, I said that earlier. I talked about the group of French-speaking ambassadors while, where while positions may not all be shared, the language is, and this means that we can express our positions more clearly and to find common positions. Language, though, can also be a factor of exclusion. When I think about Ukraine, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, at least what I've heard at the UN is that Ukrainians are no longer using, using Russian at all in international organizations. They use English instead. That is a very strong political message because I think that their diplomats and their experts express themselves much better in Russian, but it's a very clear message that we are rejecting that world and thus that language, which is the language of the invader. And so it is a, uh, a strong political message that they're sending. 
We talked about the understanding or the notion that language is more than just that. It is better understanding political and cultural challenges. What is at stake? That can be very important to understand in a negotiation. My last point might also be something that my French colleague said, namely that multilingualism beyond negotiations in small committees, in a room or in an international organization, multilingualism can be a way of garnering grassroots support, the support of the public, our citizens, and I think that's very important. Thank you. I think we have a few more minutes for questions from the audience. So just raise your hand and uh, um, a microphone will be brought over. If there are no questions, then I'll take questions, online questions, no questions in the room. So one of the first questions we got online, and I'll read it. The translation of documents has a high cost for certain international organizations. So setting up a fund for this, for French-speaking countries, do you think that would be a good solution? Um, I'm not sure if it would be the OIF or the Secretariat to respond from uh, to respond to this. Alors, <laughs> oui. Uh, Yes, indeed, it does have a cost. Many things do. Many things cost a lot. Generally speaking, negotiations, democratic processes, all have a high cost. They, they require appropriate, sufficient in, information. Uh, technical solutions that could be possible in terms of in terms of financial innovation well i'm sure there are many of those type of solutions that could be that could be explored but allow me to just repeat it and i believe that the french ambassador said this as well there are an increasing number today of technological solutions which allow for lower cost translation. For an example, there is a tool we'll be making public in the near future. It was designed by the Global Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. They worked for us to create a French version, but it's going to be translated into all UN official languages, which means that you could come out of a meeting like this one, with the summary record in the language you're interested in that would be generated by AI. And it would be almost in real time. There are development costs, of course, but later on there are lower production costs. So there are solutions. Again, and I'm perhaps repeating myself, but this isn't about appealing for the use of French, but rather for multilingualism. I think we all agree. The idea is that this is essential and it is a key component of multilateralism. So then there may be, there may be certain related questions, they're part of the discussion, but we can't prejudge the discussion itself. That takes me to my next question. Someone has written that it seems that French spe speakers are in the front lines of defending multilingualism. Do you think that's true? Or do you think there are other linguistic groups who are also fighting for multilingualism? Who would like to answer this? Ambassador? I know I don't think at all that it's only French speakers. I think that you have S uh, Spanish speakers as well. And then in the EU, you have the three working languages, French, English, and German. 
And so there, the German speakers are extremely uh, active in upholding multilingualism. So no, I don't think this is just a matter of uh, French speakers promoting or maintaining multilingualism. Thank you very much. I just wanted to come back briefly to the previous question, simply to say that if we all agree that multilingualism is a f type of universally shared value, well, to a certain extent, I'd like to say it's a common good, if you like, a shared good. And perhaps on that basis, then, we might s see it as being in harmony with recognition of that common value, that common good, namely everyone who participates in it contributes to ensuring this multilingualism really exists, that it lives. And I would really ask all the different language group, groups to do their part in sharing the costs of translation of documentation in their language. It might sound like an easy solution, but really, if not, then we're denying the fact that multilingualism is a common good and a common value. So I would suggest that we start thinking about solutions similar to what the ambassador was outlining earlier based on innovation rather than just focusing on cost cutting. And I agree entirely with my colleague in saying that no, Francophonie isn't the only group or community that is seeking to uphold this value of the, the use of French in this case, but rather broadly speaking, multilingualism. And indeed, we are in dialogue with the other language communities. The group of French speaking ambassadors talks to the other groups of uh, the other linguistic groups here represented internationally in Vienna. So that all of these languages work together, not just French on its own. Then thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Unless anybody has something to add then I would simply like to thank all the four panelists for their enriching presentations, and I'd like to thank the audience very much for its attention. Please don't forget that at 6.30, we have a roundtable in French, regional capacity building activities for operators and directors of IMS stations in the African French-speaking countries. There will be no interpretation unfortunately, but at the same time there will also be a Spanish-speaking panel and an Arabic-speaking panel. So thank you all very much and enjoy your afternoon.